Hey, what is up guys? This is Nishi from MST.TV here back with another Market Watch episode. So obviously the big thing from this past week was the release of Ancient Guardians here in the TCG, which introduced the Ogdoatic, Ursarctic, and Sulfacord archetypes into the game. Now, when we look at the few results that we have from over the weekend, we don't really see any of these decks making top cuts, so it can be really easy to write them off as not being meta relevant. However, it's still extremely early and people are definitely still experimenting with different builds and whatnot to figure out how to use these cards optimally. We've seen a few odd buyouts over the last few days, which we're going to talk about today, and we're definitely bound to see more in the next several weeks as people experiment and try different things. Let's get started. Okay, so for cards that are actually from Ancient Guardians itself, we're just looking at one today and it is Ogdo Abyss, the Ogdoatic Overlord. Of the three archetypes released in Ancient Guardians, the Ogdoatic are definitely the one with the most potential to be included in some sort of meta-relevant strategy and see competitive success. What's strange though is that the cards that are more key to the strategy that you'll actually want to run in multiples, such as Naya, Nunu, and Water Lily, are actually lower rarity cards, and the higher rarity cards in the set are the boss monsters that you'll probably run fewer copies of. Now, one of the boss monsters that has the potential to see some meta usage if the Ogdo Abyss engine takes off is Ogdo Abyss, one of the ultra rares from the set. It has a really simple effect where if it's on the field, you can send all monsters on the field to the graveyard, except for those that were summoned from the graveyard. This is interesting because it can effectively be a board wipe that even allows you to answer Red Eyes Dark Dragoon. Now, obviously, I don't know what the optimal Ogdoatic build would look like, but I would assume that this is a card that you would just want to run one copy of, since it does feel a little bit bricky otherwise. Despite that, though, the card has actually trended upwards in price since its release, starting off at $10 to $15, but now hitting the $30 mark on TCG Player. This card's price definitely depends on just how impactful the Ogdoatic engine can be if it can function as something more than just a gimmicky engine and provide real value to a meta-relevant strategy. I would assume that this card would fall back down as people open more and more Ancient Guardians up, back down to around the $15 to $20 mark, though as a new card from an archetype that definitely has a lot of meta potential, where its price goes from here is definitely up in the air. Next up, we have Phantasmal Lord Ultimate Bishbalkin. So this is a card that has seen multiple buyouts over the last month or so, ever since we first had the Ogdoatic archetype revealed to us, though it has consistently fallen back down in price shortly after being bought out. Like I remember a few days ago, I looked this card up. It was only $2. A couple of weeks ago, I looked it up and it was 10. Anyways, this card has jumped up in price yet again, currently sitting at the $9 mark lowest on TCG player. So this is a card that is seen as being a key part of an Ogdoatic combo, taking advantage of the fact that you can summon multiple tokens onto each player's side of the field. There's a video over on the DB Grinders channel that shows Jesse Cotton using this card for some combos that are really, really cool. I definitely recommend going over there and checking it out. I'll leave a link to it in the video description here as well. I'm not going to try and explain if the deck or combo is good or not, since I don't really know myself and Jesse Cotton can make any deck look really good anyways. This card has just one printing though from Infinite Gold, which was released back in 2016. So a five-year-old set now at this point, this definitely feels like something that would be reprinted in an OTS tournament pack as either a super rare or common, kind of like how Ultimaya Zulkin was reprinted in one as well. This is definitely the type of card where you hold on to your one singular copy just in case you want to play with the cards, but offload the rest just in case it does get reprinted in the near future so that you can capture as much value as possible. This is another Synchro Monster that is featured in the same combo as Bish Balkan that I just mentioned. We have Reptilian Hydra. This is a level 6 Synchro Monster that requires a tuner that is a Reptilian card, which is why you play Halki Fibrax to bring out your copy of Lamia. When this card is Synchro Summoned, you can destroy all of your opponent's monsters with 0 attack points and then draw a card for each one destroyed, which is really crazy if you think about it because with Bish Balkan, this means you destroy all of the tokens that you just summoned and then you also get to draw 5 cards. It's even sillier because the tokens on your opponent's field mean that they can't drop Gamma or Impermanence from their hand on you, so if they do have it, they would have to use it on the Bish Balkan in the first place, and then you can hopefully avoid going into this card at all. Now, of course, the whole combo does run several bricks and it feels a little bit inconsistent, but the combo is really cool if you can pull it off. This card was completely bought out off of TCG Player just a couple of days ago, but there are now a few copies listed back up, though the cheapest near mint copies at the moment are $43 a piece. 
This card does only have the one printing available from way back in Stardust Overdrive. And do keep in mind, I believe there were some production issues with that set as well. So finding an actual near mint copy available can be quite difficult. I think that before this card was only worth a dollar or two. So definitely try and dig this card up out of your bulk and offload them if you can before it too gets reprinted in an OTS tournament pack. Up next, let's take a look at Rika Queen Strena. This card is a generic rank 4 Xyz monster, and really it's not the on-field effect that this card is hyped up for, rather it has an effect that triggers when this card is tributed, allowing you to summon a rank 5 or higher Xyz plant monster from your extra deck, and then equip this card to it as a material. The card that you're typically summoning out here is Sacred Tree Beast Hyperiton, which helps to provide negation depending on the type of card that is equipped to it as an Xyz material. Unfortunately, Hyperiton only allows you to negate things during your opponent's turn so it doesn't protect against Nibiru. However, Strena would trigger if it were tributed by your opponent's Nibiru, so maybe it can function as some insurance there. Alternatively, I guess you could theoretically try to use this card in Rika. I don't think anyone is trying to make that deck work right now. More realistically, you can combo with this card in Ogdoatic and tribute it to summon something out of your graveyard and get the Hyperiton out for free. Now before this card was only a dollar or two, but now it's all the way up at the $7 mark, though we have seen it as high as $10 a piece. This is yet another card from Rise of the Duelist, which is just the set that just keeps on giving at this point. Of course that means that it should be reprinted in the 2021 Megatons, so it does have that clock ticking down its value, but if the Ogdoatic really do well with this card, expect this card's price to go back up before it comes down. Alright guys, there's one last card for Ogdoatic that I'll talk about here. There are some other pieces we should look at, but maybe we'll cover those in a market watch later this week. Number 97 Draglubion is an interesting piece of some Ogdoatic extra decks, basically allowing you to OTK pretty easily. The idea is that you go into Draglubion and then summon number 100 Numeron Dragon, who is going to have 9000 attack points, and then you punch through an opponent's monster to OTK them. This is even easier when you remember that the Ogdoatic can go into Reptilian Echidna, a Link 2 monster that requires reptiles to make, who can lower the attack power of one of your opponent's face-up monsters on the field to zero. Remember, Echidna only locks you into reptiles if you use the search effect, so if you don't do that then you can still go into this card. It's kind of gimmicky, but it's a nice little trick that you can have access to. I think that it does make the extra deck a little bit tight, especially if you're playing Bish Balkan and Hydra like we talked about earlier. Maybe you're stuck playing one package or the other, who knows? Anyways, Draglubion just has one printing from Battles of Legend Heroes Revenge, and as a result we're currently seeing it up at the $20 mark on TCG Player. This card has always been worth a few bucks, but has just spiked recently, and I actually don't really see a place for this card to be reprinted anytime soon, unless they were to slip it into King's Court for whatever reason. This is obviously a more gimmicky card to be running in your Ogdoatic extra deck, but I think that this card is going to maintain its current price point until it does get reprinted, which probably won't be until much later in the year. So the other two archetypes in Ancient Guardians, the Ursarctic and the Sulfacords, definitely aren't getting as much hype as the Ogdoatic. However, when we're talking about the market, it's still important to see what the cards are and how they work because people will still be interested in playing the decks and cards will be bought out as a result. Now for the Ursarctic, let's talk about Deep Sea Aria, a secret rare spell card out of Eternity Code. It is really simple, you banish a water monster from your graveyard to add a level 4 or lower sea serpent monster from your deck to your hand. This is important for the Ursarctic because they make use of the Deep Sea Diva package combined with cards like Neptibus and Atlantean Dragoons in order to generate massive card advantage. Now when I was on Facebook yesterday, someone showed some crazy screenshot where the cheapest copy of Aria on TCG Player was over $100 a piece. Fortunately, the card has settled down in price since then to now sitting at the $20 mark, though this is still more than double what its price was before. Keep in mind that this card is from Eternity Code, so it has just the one printing available contributing to its higher price, but should be reprinted in the 2021 Megatons as well. However, it's important to also keep in mind that the Ursarctic just aren't a very competitive archetype, so the only people that will be interested in playing the deck will be doing so for casual use. It will therefore be somewhat difficult to find someone who's actually willing to pay up for a copy of this card unless they're wanting to use it in Mermails or something like that, or unless the Ursarctic get another couple of broken cards in an upcoming core set. 
So yeah, this buyout was cool and did catch a lot of people off guard, but it was definitely short lived. So hopefully you guys didn't buy too much into it. Another water card to touch on here briefly that does have limited printings available, we have Neptibus the Atlantean Prince. So I remember when this card first came out, people were so hyped up for it thinking it would absolutely break mermails, and it is a really amazing card for all water decks, it's just that the pieces that go around this package typically aren't quite strong enough. Anyways, as we just talked about, this is a card that is just as important for the Ursarctic archetype as Deep Sea Aria as you will typically Aria into D.Va and then D.Va into Neptibus, and this is the card that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the actual combo. Before, this card was only a dollar or two a piece, but we're actually now seeing this card up at $7 for the original Breakers of Shadow Ultra Rare printing, or $5 for its Mega Tin reprint counterpart. Still really good value for a card that has historically been fairly cheap, I want to say that I hope this card will get a common reprint, but personally I'm still waiting on reprints of Marksman and Heavy Infantry, so I actually think that there's a solid chance that this card does get overlooked and will continue to trend upwards to around the $10 to $12 mark. Not that this is a card that you should be looking to actively invest in, as the deck still isn't that great and there is a chance that this card could be reprinted sometime soon, but maybe if you do own this card, it isn't a huge rush for you to go and offload your copies right away. Alright, the last card here is a Pendulum card, so of course it's relating to the Sulfa Chord archetype. Historically, Pendulum cards have consisted of various engines that get meshed together in order to support a certain archetype. We've seen it before with Mythical Beast engines, the Endymion package, and the Chronograph Sorcerer package. Well, perhaps the strongest package of all is the Dark Worm one, consisting of Dark Worm, King Gate Zero, and Dragon Shrine. The idea here is super simple. You dump the Dark Worm early on in your turn into the graveyard. It summons itself out for free and searches you a card, giving you a free body on the field to link or do something with, and a Pendulum scale in hand, which is honestly pretty crazy value. Well, with the Sulfa cards being a Pendulum archetype, it should come as no surprise that they would try to abuse some of the existing Pendulum cards in the game, most notably here is Dark Worm. The Sulfa cords, I feel like they're just a really fair archetype, they don't do anything super super crazy on their own, they need to use other cards in order to try and do broken things to keep up with other meta decks, and the Dark Worm package is just one of the ways that it attempts to do so. Even with this, I don't think that Sulfa cords are good or they're going to be meta. I think they are pretty fascinating and they do have some potential maybe if they were to get some support in an upcoming core set. We haven't seen a Pendulum archetype come out in a while, but now that we have one we've seen a jump in the price of Dark Worm. It was only 5 to $6 before, but we're now seeing Dark Worm up at the $14 mark on TCG Player for the secret rare version from Battles of Legend Relentless Revenge, which is the only hollow printing of the card that's available. If you want to play Sulfa Chords, I guess you can still try and get the commons for fairly cheap, though there is just the one common printing and they're actually a dollar each at the moment as well. Personally, I don't think it's worth jumping on the Pendulum hype train for Sulfa Chords. I'd wait for the hype to die down and then pick up your Dark Worms if you really want them once they've fallen back down to the $6 to $8 range. Okay guys, that is it for today's episode. Obviously the Ogdowatic stuff took over the bulk of the video, but there are some other interesting things happening as well. There's some smaller market movements that we'll take a look at later on this week, just to keep all of you guys as up to date and informed as possible, as well as some shifts happening outside of just what's going on with Ancient Guardians, so we'll be sure to cover that then. Anyways guys, if you did enjoy today's market watch, please make sure that you hit that thumbs up button for me and let me know. Also make sure you leave a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know what you guys think about the cards that we talked about today, or other cards in Ancient Guardians, or other cards in general that are trending on the market so I can cover them in a future market watch episode. Also if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button to get all of the latest and greatest content from both Tombox and myself here on the channel. And until next time guys, don't forget to hold on to your MST dot tv